Good morning. This is Tuesday, the 7th of July. It's good to be with you this morning. It's a beautiful day here in the Texas Panhandle, and I hope it is where you are. And uh, it's good to be with you again and to have this opportunity to look together into God's Word. Let's begin our time together with a word of prayer. Father, we are so grateful again for the day you've blessed us with and your presence in our lives, for uh, your your blessings which flow upon us continually and father we always want to be grateful for those we're mindful father of those that have asked interest in our prayers those who are sick uh, various uh, problems in their lives uh, here in Hereford and other places uh, those that have lost loved ones and we just pray father your your presence to be with them and help us father to do what we can to uh, comfort and support them we again thank you for the word that tells us about Jesus, for his commitment to your plan and carrying it out for our redemption. And we pray your blessings as we look into this word and see Jesus journeying to Jerusalem uh, for the Feast of Tabernacles. And uh, we just, again, thank you for all that you do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, well... <clears throat> When we left Jesus yesterday, uh, he was still in Galilee. Chapter 7 of John and verse 10 tells us that when his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he himself also went up, not publicly, but as if in secret. And Jesus had told them, you recall we saw yesterday, that he would not go to the Feast of Booths in Jerusalem, the Feast of Tabernacles. He and, he and his disciples do not travel with the others as they go to Jerusalem. But the verse we just read in John 17 tells us that later, however, they did go quietly to the feast. Now, various explanations have been given to resolve the apparent contradiction between what Jesus said about not going to Jerusalem and about what he did in going to Jerusalem. The most common explanation given is that the word yet should be a part of the sentence either in the text or implied back in John 7 verse 8. Several Greek manuscripts do include the word yet in Jesus' words there in verse 8. And the New International Version says, I am not yet going up to this feast because for me the, time, the right time is not yet come. And the King James and other translations do include uh, the word yet. So let's see before we get to the Jesus actually being in Jerusalem, let's turn over to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9. And Luke tells us a little bit about Jesus' trip to Jerusalem, uh, particularly one incident that happens on the way down. Luke, chapter 9, we're going to read verse 51 uh, to begin with, but we're uh, end up going all the way through verse 62 here in a few minutes. Luke 9 and verse 51. Luke says that when the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. Now, we, we mentioned this verse yesterday. Uh, since the Lord has delayed his departure, he doesn't take the usual uh, route south to Judea out of Galilee that most Jews would normally take, and that is going across and going down the eastern bank of the Jordan River. Instead, he follows the shorter, quicker, less traveled route through Samaria. He marches toward Jerusalem with a, with a determination, almost with a vengeance. The Greek idiom you recall yesterday in verse 51, he set his face toward Jerusalem, indicates his dogged determination. Well, let's read a few more verses here in Luke 9, verses 52 to 56. And he sent messengers on ahead of him, and they went and entered 
a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. But they did not receive him because he was traveling toward Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. The first time Jesus had passed through Samaria, he had been accepted as Messiah, even as the Savior of the world. Remember back in John chapter 4, verses 39 to 42. Why then do we see these Samaritans, at least in this village, rejecting him now, some 21 months later? Well, they're probably not rejecting Jesus himself so much as they are rejecting this band of Jews that's headed to Jerusalem, the rival temple of worship. James and John, however, living up to their nickname, Sons of Thunder, Mark 3.17, kindly offered to take care of the situation for Jesus, asking if they should call down fire from heaven to destroy the Samaritans like Elijah had done to his enemies, 2 Kings chapter 1, verses 10 to 12. Their impulsiveness and even, we could say, arrogance is appalling. Could they have called down fire from heaven? We do not know, but certainly they thought they could if it was the Lord's will. Jesus, however, rebukes them. He has not taught them to destroy their enemies, but to love them and to pray for them. Now, previously, when he had sent the 12 out on the limited commission, he had taught them that when they were rejected by one city, they should go to the next. Matthew 10, 23, that's what they do here. They go on to another village. Well, let's finish reading uh, here in Luke chapter 9 and see what else happens, and then we'll turn over back to John chapter 7. Luke 9, verses 57 to 62. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, Allow the dead to bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. But Jesus said to him, No one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Now, a very similar event is recorded in Matthew 8, verses 19 to 22. Whether or not the occasions are the same, we do not know. The passages, however, are sufficiently alike that the two stories can profitably be studied together. Possibly on more than one occasion, Jesus was approached by would-be disciples who made similar statements, and he responded each time in the same way. So on, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus encounters these, well, let's call them half-hearted disciples. Knowing that his death is imminent, Jesus does not want them becoming followers under false pretenses. Hardship is ahead. Only those with unqualified devotion and singleness of purpose can survive with their faith intact. Once a decision is made, there will be no turning back. 
Jesus asked nothing of these would-be disciples that he does not require of himself. He has put his hand to the plow, and he does not look back. And so Jesus goes on to Jerusalem. His visit there to the Feast of Booths is recorded in the Gospel of John, chapter 7, and we're about to turn there and uh, read from some of those verses. But first, in order to understand the events here, we need to realize that as John discusses this, there are three different groups that are mentioned. First, the religious authorities in Jerusalem are generally referred to as the Jews, verses 13, 15, and 35 in John 7. The leaders of this group, the Jews, are called the chief priest and the Pharisees, John 7, 32, but also see verses 45, 47, and 48. Then this is a way basically of referring to the Sanhedrin Council, this, this uh, uh, Supreme Court, if you will, of the Jewish uh, of government. The chief priests were mostly Sadducees, however, so keep that in mind over the next uh, several days as we look at these last six months of Jesus' life. The second group are Jews that lived in Jerusalem, that made their homes there. John 7, verse 25 mentions them. The third group is a mixed multitude that has come and is in Jerusalem and are present there for the feast. And they are called the crowd, or crowds, plural. John 12, or excuse me, 7, verse 12, verse 20, 31, 32, 43, and sometimes they're called the people. John 7, 40. Now, sometimes this number includes representatives from the Jews and the Jerusalem people, but it's mostly comprised of pilgrims that have come from other places to Jerusalem for the feast. All right, let's turn to uh, John chapter 7, and we're going to pick up in verse 11, right where we stopped just a moment ago, and read, first of all, verses 11, 12, and 13. So the Jews were asking him at the feast and were saying, where, 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 excuse me, the Jews were seeking him at the feast and were saying, where is he? There was much grumbling among the crowds concerning him. Some were saying, he is a good man. Others were saying, no, on the contrary, he leads people astray. Yet, no one was speaking openly of him for fear of the Jews. When the feast begins, Jesus is the principal topic of conversation, at least among the people in hushed tones among themselves. The people have, have, have probably heard, if not even some of them experienced the miracles that, that he has done in Galilee. But they've also not forgotten the controversy aroused on the previous trip he made to Jerusalem when he healed a lame man by a pool. That's back in John 5 in the opening verses there. Now, it's been months since that event, that miracle, months since Jesus has been in Jerusalem. And the men are, men are, are the crowds are speculating as to whether or not he's going to come to this festival. And so there's guarded talk among those who have come. He's a good man. No, he can't be a good man. He leads people astray. And, and you know, so on and so on. But that latter, latter conversation is perhaps more perceptive than the speakers realized. Today, many are 
unwilling to accept Jesus as divine, the Son of God, but they still refer to him as a good man. If Christ was not the Son of God, as he claimed to be, then he is not a good man because he's a liar. And liars are not good men. Those who refuse to accept Jesus as God's Son should not pay him lip service by calling him a good man. Well, let's go back to reading. Verses 14 through 18. But when it was now the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach. The Jews then were astonished, saying, How has this man become learned, having never been educated? So Jesus said to them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he is true, and there is no unrighteousness in him. So Jesus comes to the Jerusalem and to the feast in the midst of the feast, John says. Probably Tuesday or so, the fourth day of the celebration. He goes to the temple and begins teaching there. As a boy, Jesus had gone to the temple to learn. At the beginning of his ministry, he had gone to the temple and cleansed it. And now he goes straight there to teach. Now, keep in mind that the temple is the stronghold of the religious authorities of the Jews, especially there in Jerusalem. Jesus does not hesitate to confront his would-be executioners. <clears throat> he walks, as it were, into the lion's den and pulls the beards of the lion. This is the first time that many of the leaders have had an opportunity to hear him and his teaching. And they're astonished. They ask, how has this man become learned? He's never been educated. Now, by that last phrase, never been educated, they mean that he's not received formal training as a rabbi. And they're subtle suggestion is that you cannot really trust a self-taught man since he has no one to guide and to make sure of his orthodoxy. Jesus counters by saying, in essence, I'm not self-taught. God has been my guide. He has been sent by God and is teaching what God imparted to him. Further, in verse 17, Jesus says, if anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. A proper mindset is important to understanding anything, but it is absolutely essential in understanding God's word. Jesus' teaching remained an enigma, a, a, a puzzle to the religious leaders because though they claimed to be doing God's will, they actually do not. Well, let's go back and read now verses 19 to 24. Jesus is still speaking, and he says, Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you carries out the law? Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, You have a demon. Who seeks to kill you? And Jesus answered them, I did one deed, and you all marvel. For this reason Moses has given you circumcision, not because it was from Moses, but for the, from the fathers. And on the Sabbath you circumcise a man. 
If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses will not be broken, are you angry with me because I made an entire man well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Jesus here is giving proof that the authorities are not obeying God. He points out that they have plans to break the sixth commandment, you shall not murder. He asks, why do you seek to kill me? He knows of their plot, and he wants them to know that he knows. The out-of-town mob crowd, unaware of the situation, responds, you have a demon. Who seeks to kill you? Well, Jesus has been accused of having a demon before, but here, these, this time we need to read those words as simply them saying, you're crazy. Who's seeking to kill you? The question of whether or not Jesus is marked for death brings to mind a previous trip to Jerusalem that had resulted in the Jewish leaders seeking all the more to kill him, John 5, 18. There, you recall, Jesus has healed a man on the Sabbath and had been forced to defend his action. He now gives an additional argument for healing on the Sabbath. He pointed out that everyone believed it was right to circumcise on the Sabbath. Jewish male babies were to be circumcised on the eighth day after their birth. Leviticus 12 verse 3. Even when the eighth day fell on the Sabbath. Jesus says in effect, if it is right to sanctify one part of the body on the Sabbath, why are you angry when I cleanse the entire body. Well, there's more that's going to happen here in this discussion, but our time is gone for today. And so we'll pick up right here in John 7 and verse 25 tomorrow, looking further at Jesus' teaching here at the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem. I hope you can be here then. Let's bow in prayer to close our time this morning. Father, thank you for your word that teaches us about Jesus being here upon this earth. And thank you, Father, for the confrontation that Jesus has with these would-be um, believers or these should-be believers and for the things that he says to them that can help us as we... <coughs> excuse me. As we seek to follow and to do uh, God's will and to grow in our own faith. Thank you for the blessing of your word that you've given to us, the blessings of our physical lives, and especially, Father, the spiritual blessing of life in Christ, the forgiveness of our sins. We ask this all in his name. Amen. Well, again, I hope you have a good day, and Lord willing, we'll be back here tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. Hope you can be here then as well.